Hello and welcome to our first video on the Mantis Q40. Today we're just going to talk a little bit about the device and what it can do and maybe some things that you might want to be aware of that it's capable of. We're also going to look at some orientation to the unit. So let's go ahead and get started. So the Mantis is manufactured by Humanware Technologies and is distributed by the American Printing House for the Blind. The Mantis has its own built-in editor. This editor is more like a scratch pad which means it has some basic functions. You can do copy, paste, uh, selections, things like that. Um, you can't do the more advanced functions like advanced formatting or spell checking. So I guess if you wanted to use the editor, you certainly can, and it's very useful for things like making lists, maybe a simple assignment, maybe uh, just simple notes, things like that that you might need to remember, phone numbers, things like that. It's also a great way to introduce your student to how file management works. It's a good way to teach them how, what, you know, naming a file is, where they go, how it's stored on a device. If you feel that that is something that would benefit your student rather than just putting them in front of a computer and trying it that way. So that's, it's a nice, simple way to start that. The Mantis also has a built-in calculator. It can connect to Wi-Fi. It can interface with Bookshare and NFB Newsline. You need accounts for both of those. It also has uh, some other functions that we'll gradually be talking about. We talked about the file management, and that's a really big one um, for, for me. Uh, myself, I think it's important to, to teach kids how to do that because it's such an overreaching function that we find in a lot of devices. Let's go ahead and go into the orientation part of the video. So first thing, a uh, question I get is, why do we call it a QWERTY keyboard? Well, the reason is kind of interesting. It's because this upper level of keys on your left hand, uh, the top row of letters go to Q, W, E, R, T, Y. And that is why it's called a QWERTY keyboard. So it's kind of a, there's your factoid for the day. So let's go ahead and flip that up towards us and have the part that has, uh, that faces us, the panel that faces us kind of show towards the video. And I'm sorry, I don't think we can get all of it just because of the camera angle, but we're gonna give it a shot. So if you take both of your thumbs and place them on the sides of the unit and uh, on the sides and corners on the outside and bring them in, you will find with your left, thumb and your right thumb will be focused on a key and these are thumb keys. The thumb keys that you are touching now are the previous thumb key on your left and the next thumb key on your right. Those control menus, they move to previous and next and up and down and uh, kind of help you with that. If you move your fingers or your thumbs actually closer in together, you're going to come across two keys, one on your left and one on your right that are longer than the thumb than the previous and next thumb key. These are what's called your panning keys. Sometimes they're called your left and right thumb keys, but I like panning because that kind of um, gives them a, a name to what they, they do. So these keys are used to pan your display, to move your display to the next 40 characters. Further in, and the exact center pretty much of your front panel is a small circular button, and it's called a home button or the menu key. This key will take you to the main menu of your device and will uh, take you out of terminal mode, which means that if your device is wirelessly or USB connected to another device, it takes you out of that connection and brings you back into the internal functioning of the device. That's the front panel. Just so you know, the right panel is completely empty. There is nothing on the right-hand panel. The left-hand panel, and we're going to start from that braille display and moving backwards, is we're going to come up and here is a USB type A port. This is where you would stick a uh, thumb drive or USB port and uh, for data transfer or uh, data storage. If you move your finger further up, you'll find a small button. This button is the power switch. You would hold this button in for about 
four to five seconds to turn the unit on. And once the unit is on, if you wanted to have the option of a shutdown, you can hold this for about three seconds to four seconds and you'll be offered, offered the option of shutting down. And we'll, we'll kind of go into that a little later. Towards the back of the unit is a port, and this is a USB-C port for charging. It can also, I believe, be used for some data transfer if you have a device that's a USB-C, but it's mainly used for charging. There is also, you'll notice a little gap um, between where the case hits and the actual outside of the unit. And that's where there's an indicator light. If you have a sighted friend or you yourself have enough light perception to see, there will be a small blinking light to indicate whether it's charging or turned on. And the light is green, which is kind of semi-unfortunate because so is the case. <laughs> so it's, sometimes it might be hard to find, but that's all right. Along the back is a USB slot or a US, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a USB slot, it is an SD card slot. So there is one USB slot um, on the left side and an SD slot in the back. Along the bottom, if you were to take the case off, you would see that there is the serial number in Braille and there's also some screws that will allow you to open that back panel and access the battery. Let me just reposition myself here a little bit and we're going to kind of look at the top of the device. As I mentioned before, there is a 40 cell Braille display. When it is turned off or not powered, the Braille cells sort of float and you can feel them. When it's turned on and the cells are actively held downward, these uh, cells will, you won't be able to feel the dots. It's really kind of interesting how that, how that works and how it feels if you've never worked with the Braille display before. Above those cells, each cell has what is called a cursor routing key assigned to it. And there are 40 cursor routing keys just as there are 40 cells in the display. These cursor routing keys are especially helpful when it comes to editing. Because if you are in a, let's call it an editor document, and you want to make a change and your cursor is all the way at the end here and you're just navigating, you're using your braille panning and you're reading along and you're proofreading your stuff and you come across an error and you just would like to move that cursor right to that cell. You know, it's like, it's kind of like clicking, being able to take your mouse and click and put the cursor where you want it. That's what these cursor routing keys allow you to do. It's very helpful when Again, when you're editing, sometimes it can be when you're selecting and things like that. And we're going to talk about why, uh, how things showed up, show up when they're selected and how you can tell the difference between different kinds of objects. But that's kind of in the future. That's the Braille display portion. Now, um, there are several ways to talk about the keyboard. The user manual uh, chooses one way. What they choose to do is they assign rows coming from the top of the device and to the bottom. And there are um, what they're defining as six rows. And there really are about six. So, uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do it a little differently, but I'm telling you that it's done a different way in the manual, just so that you're aware if you're referencing that and watching this video at the same time. So I'm going to place my fingers along the space bar. As I'm sure you're aware, the space bar is the largest key on the top of the device when you're entering uh, touch typed um, items on a QWERTY keyboard. It's a great reference point. So I'm, I have my hand on the space bar and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my right index finger and my left index finger and move them to the outsides of the space bar. There are two keys on either side of the space bar and they are literally the same thing. There is a left alt to the left of the space bar and a right alt to the right of the space bar. When I was teaching students, I used to call it the alt sandwich because this space bar is sandwiched in between the two alt keys. It helped them kind of remember the, that the alt keys were here, especially when it, they started being introduced to things like the windows key, the tab key, the control key, especially the control key um, because of that. So um, I'm going to take 
uh, uh, take a tour here, I'm going to come up around and I'm going to show you the right side of that space bar. So as I said before, we have that Alt key. To the right of the Alt is Control. There is a right control and a left control. And basically, they do the same thing. So you don't really need to concern yourself with which one you're touching. It's just mainly which one is easier for you to, you to hold your finger down and, and use with different commands. To the right of the control is what we're going to call the, the arrow key area. And it's laid out a little differently. So when you come from your control and you are moving to your right, you see your left arrow followed by your down arrow, which is indicated with a little raised bump here. And then if you move more to the right, it's the right arrow. And that is, then you reach the edge of the display. The up arrow is located just above that down arrow. So if you have your fingers rested on it, I tell students to kind of rest your fingers, your um, index on that right, or your index, I'm sorry, on the left arrow. Your maybe your middle finger on the middle area so you can hit your up and down and your ring finger on that right arrow. If that's something that you are gonna be using your arrows to do a, a lot of things like to navigate. Above that uh, up arrow is the shift key. The shift key is the uh, longer key on, in this area of the, of the, dis, of the uh, device. It's obviously not as long as the space bar though. There is a left and a right shift. We are on the right shift. If you move your hand up again, you're going to find the enter key, which as noted is somewhat or significantly shorter than that shift key. Above the enter key is this other row, which we don't really need to worry too much about. It has slashes and, um, and uh, brackets on it, and we're just gonna keep going up. So above that is the backspace. That obviously is, well, takes you back one space. And there's a difference between backspace and delete that we will, we will cover. If you move your fingers up one more time, and this is the uppermost and rightmost key on the device, you have your delete key. And we'll kind of explain that one a little later. So let's come back to that space bar. Now that we've talked about some keys on the right and I'm going up, we're gonna talk about keys on the left and going up. So I'm going to come to the left and again, to the left of the space bar is that left alt key. To the left of that key is your Windows key. And it, you know, it's that's going to be your menu key. And we'll talk about how that differs from the front menu key in uh, later videos. To the left of that is the function key, which changes the function of your F keys, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, no need to worry about it right now just to know that it's there. And one more to the left is the control key. Remember, we have a control key on the right and a control key on the left, and this is the control key on the left. If we move up, again, speaking of things that there are two of, there's that left hand shift key, which again, you can differentiate because it's a little longer than your caps lock key, which is above it. The caps lock can be used to either lock the capital case, or it can be used as a modifier key, and we will talk about that another in another video, but just so that you know again that it's there, that's all you need to know. If you're familiar with keyboards, then great. If not, it's, it's okay just to know where it is. So above the caps lock is the tab key. Tab key is used a lot for navigation, so it's good to know where this tab key is located. Above the tab key is the tilde and the grav accent key. We don't use this a lot in English, but it's used a lot in other languages, but it is also the sort of a gateway to the number row, which comes all the way across and funny actually ends with the backspace key on the right. So that is the number row. If you go above that number row, and if you're located on the key that is the upper and leftmost key, that is the escape key. I 
like to tell people about that key. It's kind of one of the more functional keys on the keyboard. It is along what we call the function row, which is your F1 through F12 keys, which are used for special functions. And it also ends in a key that we've already talked about. If you follow it all the way to the right, you will find the delete key. So that's kind of a different way to go over the location of keys on a device, but I kind of like it better than just sort of spitting them out um, in rows, just because it, you, you are given a frame of reference to each key. But again, this method isn't perfect. One thing that I do like to give a hint to, to teachers, is you're not going to want to mark every key if your child does not know how to touch type yet. You have the little raised bump on the F and the J, just like you do on most other keyboards. But I like to tell kids or tell teachers that they can put things like tactile markers on a few keys that are going to help them to be able to find other locations. For example, I find the number row kind of hard to navigate and I don't like counting all the time to find the number that I want. So a lot of times what I will do is I'll put a little bump dot on the number five. And that way I know that anything one through four is on the left, anything six through zero or other is on the right. The same thing can be done in the function row if you want to put it on the um, one of the F keys, but it already has a slight raise on the, um, the F4 key. It's very, very slight, but there isn't that difference between function, like every four function keys, like there isn't a standard keyboard. So you have to kind of look for those markings. Some people, because F5 is, look, is used a lot, they like to stick a sticky on that F5 key. Um, you know, for refreshing the page or, or whatever, because that's what F5 does on a computer keyboard. But there's a lot of different methods and none of them are wrong. It's just picking which one works best for you and your student. I hope this introduction has been helpful. Please feel free to subscribe to our channel or to check back for updates because there will be more videos added to this playlist in the future. Thanks and have a great day.